for this this morning is a privilege. It really is. I want you guys to know that. So our prayer for you guys coming this morning as we're talking about this topic about combating the American culture is not necessarily how do we go out into the world and fight like all these different worldviews or these different ideologies. That's not necessarily the case. What I mean by combating the American culture this morning is the life that we live here in America, the world, and looking at the desires that are consistent within the world. And you see these fleshly desires and you see the sensuality and you see the temptations that we every single day are faced with. We know as Christians that we have an enemy. He's the devil. He's the great adversary. And he comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. So this morning, I I pray as we look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, that we as Christians can arm ourselves once again to know that there is an enemy that we face, but he's a defeated foe. And as we face the challenges that the enemy throws to kill, steal, and destroy in John 10, 10, we also realize that we have a body of death, as we're told in Romans chapter 7. And there are things that this body of decay wants us to do that run contrary to what the Bible says, what our Heavenly Father says. And as we're challenged with the body of death, we know that we live in a fallen world that is groaning, as we're told in Romans 8, to be one, once again restored back to its maker. These are challenging times that we live in. So this morning, with the time that I have with you guys, is to help each and every single one of us to combat against the challenges that you face. And as we do that, that we come together, because here's the thing, my friends, whether you're living here or North Carolina, from coast to coast, we are the body of Christ. And we are more powerful together than what? Than separate. But the thing that we're finding, and this is, this is a tragedy, that's why it is refreshing. And I see Dean here as your chairman of the elders, and, and, and the time I got to spend with a lot of your pastors is that you have shepherds here that try to build and unite the body. We're not to be divided. We're to be united, right? In the bond of peace, we're told in Ephesians 4, verse 6. Christ is the head of the church. But what we're finding, you guys, when I'm traveling around, I've been doing this for quite some time, the Christian community is breaking apart. And we have a young generation of supposed Christians who don't know really a thing or two about what they believe and why they believe it, and there's a disconnect. There's a generational disconnect. What I refer in one of my books called Abandoned Faith, there's a lack of transferable faith. This is a tragedy. So when those temptations come, when the enemy's active, remember he never sleeps and he's trying to destroy your marriage, He's trying to have you not only have a dejected faith, but reject your faith. And we're seeing that time and time again in America and around the world. Nothing's new under the sun. Satan attacked Adam and Eve in the garden, and he attacks us still today. He tries to break up that fellowship between us and our creator. But as we see these things growing, how do we combat them? Not in a, combative, in, a, in a combative way to where you get so hostile, but rather as a child of God that we understand the challenges that we face in the culture, that we wrestle with inwardly, but through the power of our Savior and knowing that we have been given the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, that, we are de- that he deposit us. He, we, there's a guarantee, my friends, that as we walk in the Spirit, we can combat against these issues in our, in our faith. Amen? Amen. We, 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 we are not to live a defeated faith, my friends. So I'm not here to give you stats and show you how messed up everything is. We know how messed up things are, don't we? We're here to talk about as we come together under this roof, and we're thankful for the freedoms, we're thankful for the love, we're thankful for the gifts that are represented, we're thankful for the families, for us to be reminded that God can use each and every one of us, so we need to unite together because we're seeing a lot of people walking away from the faith, abandoning the faith, and we are to continue to what? Stand strong in our faith. So as we see the stage in which things have been set up in our culture and the issues that are rising politically, right? And on the family status, and you're seeing more divorce, and many of you guys come from broken families. Many in this room have been molested. 
Many of you have been violated. Many of you have been betrayed. You've been abandoned. You've been in despair. You're battling depression. We are here to look at what Scripture shares in Ephesians 5 and take, not just note, but apply these truths and to be fierce and not to give up. But as I share that with you guys this morning, we know that we serve an awesome God, but God has placed people strategically in our lives to help us in the process of sanctification. Amen? And we're grateful for that. So whatever challenges, whatever struggles you face, let us know that God is right here amongst us. And he wants to take that brokenness and he wants to bring healing. So when we see the stage in which we live in today and the state in which our country is headed, how did we get here? Well, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, I think he lays it out pretty, pretty succinctly when he writes in one of his books. In the 1950s, kids lost their innocence. They were liberated from their parents by well-paying jobs, cars, and lyrics and music that gave rise to a new term, the generation gap. In the 1960s, kids lost their authority. It was a decade of protest. Church, state, and parents were all called into question and found wanting. Their authority was rejected, yet nothing ever replaced it. In the 1970s, kids lost their love. It was the decade of meism dominated by hyphenated words beginning with self, self self-image, self-esteem, self-assertion. It made for a lonely world. Kids learned everything there was to know about sex and forgot everything there was to know about love. And no one had the nerve to tell them there was a difference. In the 1980s, kids lost their hope, stripped of innocence, authority, and love, and plagued by the horror of a nuclear nightmare. Large and growing numbers of this generation stopped believing in the future. In the 1990s, kids lost their power to reason. Less and less were they taught the very basics of language and truth and logic. And they grew up with the irrationality of a postmodern world. In the new millennium, kids woke up and found out that somewhere in the midst of all of this change, they had lost their imagination. Violence and perversion entertained them till none could talk of killing innocents since there was no innocent anymore. That's tragic when you see this progressiveness that's taking place that has led to a level of godlessness in our country. So as I mentioned before, though, when you and I see that our country and many of our families, and dare I even say many churches have become a slave to sin, we see a lot of idolatry, there's adultery, there's a lot of debauchery, there's a lot of sinfulness out there. We commit all of it. We're humans. We're born in sin. We all need a savior. But there's hope, as I mentioned before. So I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. We're going to take three key things that Paul the Apostle mentions to the church of Ephesus that we are still looking at through the inspired word of God today. And take these three key concepts and see how we can use them to combat the culture that we live in today. This, in Ephesians chapter 5, can be known as proper action and how to live in the world. Proper action and how you and I as Christians are to live in the world. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, it says, look carefully. Literally in the Greek, it means to be accurate. It's based on a standard, circumspectly to look carefully so one will not stumble. So in the Bible, right out the gate, when Paul says, hey, look carefully, means you have to live accordingly to God's standard. When you do that, you're going to live an accurate life. So when he says, look carefully on how you walk, or literally how you live, notice, not as unwise, but as wise. Verse 16 says, making the best use of your time, literally in the Greek, it means to do something with intensity, to be urgent. So right off the bat, to be proper in the way that we are to act in this world as we combat against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 
We are to be very careful, my friends, and how we live in this world so we don't stumble. To be wise, not to be unwise. To be intense in what God has called you to do. And, and let me say something to that, please. Recently, when I was with a group of college students teaching them biblical worldview training and showing them all these various different worldviews that challenge the biblical worldview. And afterwards, I went and I did this big uh, Q&A time with college-age students. And one of the first questions, which is a common question, by the way, that I get often, Mr. Jimenez, well, I think in this case it's Mr. Jimenez, some white kid. <laughs> and I, what I do now is I just say, next, next question, you know, you just offended me. You can't even pronounce my name. No. They said, hey, why on earth, why are Christians so like dry? Where's the passion? Where's the intensity? If all these things are true, what you're saying, people are going to hell. There's a Satan. We have issues. There's brokenness. Why aren't Christians doing more? That's a great question, isn't it? It's a convicting one. And as that student boldly explained what they meant by that, and I'm taking it in, and I start seeing other students start nodding in agreement, thinking, you know, you're right. A lot of Christians today are not walking carefully in how they live so they don't stumble. Many of them are stumbling. They're compromising. We're living hypocritical lives, and we're not living with a sense of urgency that Christ can return at any given time, and as we're here, how many people are we investing in? How many people are we loving and caring for, sharing the gospel? I met with one of your, your members of this church who for many years has been going around the world sharing the gospel, and I just was encouraging him and thanking him for his faithfulness. It was encouraging to me. Right? It was encouraging because he had, there's a sense of urgency going on college campuses and sharing Jesus with these young men and women. And the Bible tells us that we're to be so intense and so urgent in what we're called to do because the days are good? No, because the days are evil. They're not getting any better. We know what's going to happen with the gloom and doom in this world, and we know ultimately one day our Savior Jesus will what? He will restore. He'll make all things new. And when he comes to do that, he says in Matthew 16, Behold, I am coming soon, and I have my what? My reward for you. So when you and I are faithfully doing things that God has called us to do, looking carefully, using the best use of our time with a sense of urgency, because the days are evil, verse 17, we're not going to be foolish, but we're going to understand what the, what the will of the Lord is. That word understand means that you and I will have a comprehension in an intellectual way. You're going to know, you're going to know what God's will is for your life, what he has called you and I to do. So out of these three verses, my friends, what we find is Three key things, as I mentioned, that you and I need to daily apply in our lives so that we can continue to stand strong in our faith and the culture that we live in. The first thing that we see here is be wise. Be wise. That is a prayer that you and I should be praying every single day of our life. You should be praying that over your spouse. You should be praying that over your circumstances. God, help me to apply your wisdom in whatever situation that you're going through in life. You may not even know what that is, right? We don't know the future. So we just pray, God, give me wisdom for today. Give me wisdom. I want to walk in wisdom as I spend time in your word and as I pray. The second thing we see here in Ephesians chapter 5 is that we need to be useful. We need to be useful. Every single one of us in this room desires to be used by God, don't we? Nobody wants to say, ah, oh, you know, what do you do here at this church? Not nothing. You know, what do you do in your community? Nothing. What do you do in life? Nothing. I'm just useless, and I'm proud of it. Do we get that kind of attitude? No, we want to be useful. When we feel like we are useless, that nobody cares about us, we don't feel good about ourselves. But when we know that we're being used for something greater than us, we feel what? Not just special, but we belong. There's a sense of belonging and it's beautiful when we see that God used Matt. God is using your pastor. God is using you. And if I, if I may, 
to older couples in this room. I thank you for your legacy and your faithfulness. God has used you in your children's lives. Whether they accept that or not, God has used you. We can't be walking around with a defeated attitude and think, you know what, I've been a Christian all these, all these years, and God, you haven't used me. No, God has. Be thankful. There's a lot of great things that God has done in your life and will continue to do. But the great thing about the Christian faith is, think about how much more God can use you when you say, Lord, use me. It's a simple prayer. For many years as a child, I would go to bed at night praying in my bed with my little dachshund, little Cody, right? And I'd say, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. I didn't know what that was at 8, 9, 10 years old. But I just knew that that's what I needed to pray. So the first thing is be wise, be useful. So number three, to be fruitful, to be fruitful. You and I as a Christian, when we know what God has called us to do, we know intellectually and we're living it out, what God has called me to do, you'll bear fruit. You'll bear fruit. So a lot of you right now, you're thinking, Jay, I need more wisdom in my life. I need to be praying that God will use me more, that I can be more productive in what I'm doing so I can see more fruit. Absolutely, I'm praying the same thing. So we can join each other to pray those prayers. Let's not, though, as we move forward and look at some things that oppose those three areas, let's not have a defeated attitude. You guys with me? Let's not have a defeated attitude. If there are issues in your life, if you've been struggling, please do not let the enemy take advantage of that and keep you in the mindset when you leave this church and you go home that you're like, I'm just stupid. Nobody, you know, God doesn't really want to use me. I mean, what really spiritual, Jay, I don't have your gifts. I was sitting there just like many of you looking up at, this, at these kind of people saying, man, how do they get that smart, right? How, how do they know all that kind of stuff? When I was a kid, to put me up on stage would, I'd pee in my pants, okay? I didn't today, thank God, right, Dean? <laughs> and I saw that this was a see-through, so I was like, I was nervous. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know I would get so afraid. But again, go back to a simple prayer, God, use me. This is not in my own strength. It's by the power of God, and you see fruit. People come to Christ, loving, discipling people, using the spiritual gifts, uniting together. Now, when you and I look at those four things, and we look at the culture that we live in, what are the opposites when it comes to wisdom and being useful, being productive, and being fruitful? Well, one of the things that we're seeing is this relativistic understanding of, like, I determine my own truth. Well, that ultimately leads to, through this disobedient heart, it leads to godlessness, that's not necessarily atheism. It's saying, I want to live the way I want to live. Whether there is a God or not, and you guys listen, there is a lot of Christians like that. Oh, they believe in all this stuff. They're not going to deny what Christ did on the cross, but they're carnal Christians. Their actions, right, do not reflect God's word. And as such, there's a sense of godlessness, that rolls out. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we know progressively, as things progressively get worse, there are going to be more and more people who are lovers of pleasure rather than being lovers of God. So you think about the people that you and I encounter on a daily basis. How many people do we know that they, they love themselves? They love the pleasure of the world more than they love God. Young people t- I'm having so many conversations these days with young people. Jay, how can my friend say they're a Christian, but they're having sex, or they're doing this, or they're supporting this lifestyle, or this movement, or this agenda, but they say they're a Christian? And a lot of the young generation, they're baffled by that. Well, I say, a lot of people here, the Bible says, have the appearance in 2 Timothy 3, 4, they have the appearance of what? Of godliness. But guess what? They deny its power. They deny its power. The opposite of one living wise before God, who is an all-wise God, is saying that I can do whatever I want because my truth is my truth. That may be your truth, but this is your truth. And you and I have to tolerate all of it. It's a walking contradiction. It leads to godlessness because there is no ultimate standard of justice. You and I as human beings, through social convention, do not determine what is right for us as humans. God is the ultimate standard. And when you and I don't pursue him and follow his commandments, it will lead to a life of godlessness. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 25 says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Anything contrary to God in what he says is a lie. If you want to take God's order in marriage, in the church, and twist it and change it because you think you can better enhance it, that is a lie. When you think that you can determine the truth besides the Bible, if you want to deny the resurrection and say that it, it didn't exist and that humans are just, they can, they're perfectible creatures, that is a lie. If you deny that there's sin in the world or you're just a good person and you'll get to heaven on your own because of your own self-righteousness, my friends, that is a lie. And notice we're told in Romans chapter 1 that they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and serve the creature rather than the creator. Aren't we seeing that today? Think about, my friends, think about how much that we pursue of created things in the world rather than the creator. So relativism and godliness or godlessness is contrary to living a wise life. So when you and I take wisdom, being useful, and being fruitful in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, you could summarize it as accurate living, right? Accurate living. So how do we respond accurately in our living as a Christian? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 7 through 8 says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godly, godliness is of value in every way. Notice, in every way? How so? In the life that we live presently and also in the life to come. There is a guarantee, my friends, that when you and I live a godly life and we train ourselves. I was telling the first service, you know, my wife and I being, I've been traveling a lot and haven't really regularly got to my workouts, you know. And after all that bacon yesterday morning, you know, man, those guys who were here, you know, five pounds later, you know. I was feeling just like sluggish, you know, and people were shoving more food in my mouth. I was like, listen, Mark, I mean, tell you, yeah, I love this stuff, but stop feeding me. You know what I mean? They got donuts in the, in the green room, you know, and I'm looking at them like, no, rebuke it. And, you know, with the cross through anointed oil, <laughs> threw them out, you know. But I'm like, all this food, and you just gravitate towards them. I say, no, I can't do that because I want to stay fit, right? <laughs> and so I had to go for a run yesterday in this hot, stinking sun. I was, felt like I was in hell, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was in purgatory. So I'm running to just, just burn the sweat off, you know, and these calories. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. But I had to do it. And I'm thankful because I feel so much better when I work out. But think about spiritually. Think about how many times we want to go to do more, right? We have this sense of urgency. And then like, oh, yeah, I'll get to it later. You know, I really would like to do that. I really like to reach that person. But, I, you know, I mean, Tom, I'll get to it later. I really want to join the worship because they need it because Tom is not a good musician. And I need to help Tom out. Amen, Tom? Amen. Amen. Yes. But, I, you know, and then there's an excuse. We're lazy. We succumb to certain things. But the Bible says to train, meaning don't give up. Pursue it. Devote time to it. There is a sense of urgency, and when you and I do that, it will bless us in the present life, but also what? We're making dividends and investment in the future for all eternity. Second thing that we have to combat in the culture today is fear. It's fear. Stop and think, my friends. Just stop and think. How much fear is crippling you right now? How many things in your life right now that you know that you need to deal with, but because of fear, you choose not to do it? How many of you guys like Matt here have been thinking and contemplating about the next move that God is moving you on and you know that but you ignore it because you're too afraid to listen because that would mean that you have to what? Pack up your bags, leave your comfort zone and go do something to bear fruit, to bear more fruit, amen? Think about fear in our lives. Think about all the things that you and I are afraid of right now, not just cyber terrorism, not just little rocket man in North Korea. The first service, I said North Carolina. I was like, what? I didn't mean to say North Carolina. <laughs> North Carolina dropping bombs in the United States, you know. But North Korea, I mean, we could get so scared. Russia, collusion, this and that. Mass shooters. Mass shootings that are taking place. We don't know when they're going to occur and when they're going to happen. What school is going to be next. But we know that there are psychopaths out there, don't we? That will take innocent lives because they want to what? They want to prove something. It's demonic. It's evil. Think about how much fear that you, you and I have over our children, 
over our kids, grandkids. Think about how much fear maybe that you have in your own marriage right now. But before I came up here, our youngest of four, Haley, this is a text that she sent me. If you guys can see, there's all these little hearts. that she's, We have to take the device away from her because, like, stop texting people. You know what I mean? But she sends me all these hearts, and then she says, I love you, all these hearts, you very much. Where are you? <laughs> I'm working, you know, I'm traveling. There are so many good people in the world who can get you in the right way. <laughs> that's my that's my advice for my seven-year-old. But it was actually a good way of that, in a sense, despite all the stuff that we're afraid of, here you have a little seven-year-old, my daughter, our youngest, right? Who thinks she's the boss in our family, amen? I don't know why these youngest kids think that. But she's, it's a reminder, they're good people, though. So when there's evil, there's good. Billy Graham says, notice what he says. He says, historians will probably call our era the age of anxiety. Anxiety is the natural result when our hopes are centered in anything short of God and his will for us. We're living in a time now where I believe strongly that fear has destroyed many relationships and opportunities for you to live a wise life, a useful life, and a fruitful life because of fear. And most of the time, and I'm speaking from experience, in one of my recent books, Stand Strong in Your Faith, I really wrote that book for myself. The first chapter was about doubt, and the second chapter was about fear. And I began to look, my friends, at the fear that I was going through that was ultimately really leading me to depression and contemplating even the ministry that God had called me to do and even questioning whether or not I I should continue to do it. So I'm standing up here to tell you guys that I don't have all the answers. I'm a human being just like you that have my own challenges. And please pray for my wife because she's got to deal with me. Amen? These are challenging times, but fear can cripple us so much so where this new generation is leading to suicide. Teen suicide is one of the leading causes of death among young people. But yet they have so much. They have so much that we've given them. And yet why are they so depressed Why are they filled with anxiety? Why are moms and dads filled with anxiety? So accurate living to respond against fear is we need to trust in God as our shield. Trust in God as your shield. He will protect you. Just like when he told Abraham not to be afraid, not to be in fear, but to trust in his protection. You and I need to do the same. That's how we combat the culture of fear that we're living in today. We need to acknowledge that no matter where we go in life, God is our shield. Mom, dad, you can't take it all off of them. The more that you and I interfere, we prevent God to intervene. You can't always take the blow. You can't always solve their problems. And a lot of times it's motivated by fear because you think if I can't do it to protect my son, my daughter, my grandkids, then no one's going to protect him. No, God is your protection. God is your shield. David pronounced, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27. Notice how intimately David felt about God's protection. There's an intimate relationship here. He felt the peace. David felt the joy as he was being sought after by Saul and many other people who wanted him to be killed. He felt God's protection. He sought after it. And we see that he lived it. This kind of assurance requires Time with God, however, my friends. It takes a willingness to trust and obey even, even when it's hard. But we trust in the protection of God. We need to surrender, my friends, the fear. From the Old Testament, do not be afraid. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. Jesus comes and says, I don't bring you fear. Fear not, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives, do I give unto you, right? Do not be troubled. Jesus says, for I am with you. We see that over and over again. And yet, why are so many churches filled with so much anxiety and stress? When you and I are consumed with fear, at the end of the day, we're not living a life of faith because we're driven out by fear. We need to repent. And finally, what combats against wisdom being useful and being fruitful is apathy. Is apathy. So there's a level of godlessness in our culture, no question, and we're challenged and tempted sometimes to do things our way. There's the challenge oftentimes to fall into fear, to be crippled by it because of the flesh and the worry that is in our mind that we're drowning in. But then there's apathy. 
Dr. John Townsend, who's a well-respected author in a book called The Entitlement Cure, he lists how narcissism, people that have a sense of entitlement, have negatively impacted pretty much every aspect of life. For example, he says, companies that must deal with unmotivated employees is a big factor. Number two, parents are faced with raising self-centered children. Three, dating relationships don't work because of an I'm special and I deserve more than you're giving me attitude. Four, young adults refuse to grow up, so go nowhere in life. They have no plan, no vision to be productive. Five, leaders expect special treatment because of their position, not because of their character. Six, marriages are torn apart by the narcissism of a spouse. Seven, ministries are saddled with prima donna leadership, like Pastor Tom Grassi. You know, no, I'm teasing. It's the last one, Tom. We had dinner last night. We're buds, huh? Right, Tom? Amen. Professionals wander from job to job looking for a place that will see them as the underkind that they consider themselves to be, well, uh, whether they're productive or not. So you have this narcissistic thing where it's like, look, I'm in this business. I'm something special. Forget who I work for. You need to work for me. Or things need to work out my way in order for me to be productive. Like that self-centeredness, you guys, let's be honest. Think about how self-entitled we have become in our society and life. Because anytime a Christian is apathetic towards things, are we really doing the things that God has called us to do? So I leave you guys with this. And I appreciate your kindness, your love for allowing me to be here on behalf of your pastor while he's away to rest with his wife, Lord willing, is that we need to pray as a church that we are more wise in the culture that we live in. That you need to examine the areas of your life where you need to be more useful. And let me just tell you this. God wants to use you more than he's using you. Isn't that awesome? And as he uses you more, you're going to be more fruitful. You're going to be more fruitful. So oftentimes, as a Christian, when I look at those things, I think, okay, you know, how do I do that, though? Where, where, God, where are some good examples where I've seen you use people in the culture that they lived in? Well, look around. There are a lot of people. We just saw a few months ago the passing of Billy Graham. Now, I was in Charlotte, and, you know, being a whole part of that whole thing and knowing a lot of the staff at BGA. That's an end of one era. But guess what? We got Franklin. We got Will. We got we got plenty of other people. People are like, well, what about Billy? He's, he's dead. He's with the Lord. 99 years he was on this earth. God used him in mighty ways. And guess what? Just because Billy's gone now doesn't mean that Christianity's going to end. We have presently examples from Pastor Phil on down of people, men and women, who are standing strong in their faith. But when you and I look at the Bible, and we look at how people were accurately living in the culture in which they lived, there are so many of them. For example, look at Noah. When you and I look at Noah chapter, in Genesis chapter 6, Noah, we're told, was a righteous man. He was blameless in his generation. Why? Because the Bible says that Noah walked with God. So one thing, accurate living, according to the Bible, and how Noah lived, was he lived a righteous life. We as Christians need to rightly live our lives before God faithfully, that we be holy and blameless, that we walk worthy of the gospel, that people around us can see Christ in us. People saw the difference with Noah. A second example is Joseph. When you and I look at Joseph in Genesis chapter 39, what did he stand for in the culture? He stood for purity. When they wanted to attack him, when Pharaoh's wife wanted him to lay in bed with him, he did not want to do it. Why? Because he didn't want to sin against God. He knew that if he did what she wanted him to do, and according to the culture, what was accepted by them in the culture, if he did that, he would not be, what, standing for God. It would affect his relationship. By choosing a physical relationship, it would have destroyed his chance for God to use him in a spiritual way. He was not willing to do that. Noah stood for righteous living in the midst of very, very sick, twisted, perverted people. Joseph stood faithfully before God, even though he was in prison many times and betrayed, but he stood for purity. He didn't, he didn't neglect that. Jeremiah stood for justice and he remained faithful against the opposition. The Bible tells us that he stood against the leaders who were worshiping other gods and God used Jeremiah to stand fast for 40 years and nobody, his own people did not repent. I know many of you can relate to that, but he stood for justice when nobody else would. What did Peter stand for in the New Testament? Peter stood for truth. 
And he shepherded the church despite massive persecution. He was told in Acts chapter 4 to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And he says, we can't do that because he stood for truth. Many of you guys this morning are being silenced. People are telling you not to speak the truth. And you are not to bend to that human uh, demand. You are to stand strong what God has called you to do. So let me pray for us right now. Let me pray that we as a congregation of believers, that we will be wise in what we're called to do. Accurate living. That we'll be useful, prepared for every good work for the master, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And that we be fruitful. That we would bear fruit in all things and that, that will bring glory to God and him alone. Father, I do pray and I ask for a tremendous blessing over this community of believers. Thank you for kindred. Thank you for their staff. Thank you, Lord Father, for their faithfulness here. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room right now. Lord, those who are discouraged, those who feel like they're just useless, that they can't be used. God, many people here in this room right now, that are being beat up in the world, and they've succumbed to a lot of temptation, and they have fallen, and they're in bondage of sin. God, that you'd set them free this morning. That they would cry out to you right now and say, Lord, forgive me. Wash me, Lord. You are so faithful when I've been faithless. I've disobeyed you. I need your forgiveness. Restore me, Lord, back to you. And God, I pray that that will be done to that man or that woman here this morning. Father, I pray for unity in this church. I pray that we'd be more wise in, in what we're called to do, that we'd be more useful, and that we'd be more fruitful in all that we do. And all God's people said, amen.